In this short video, I'm going to give you an introduction into how to best secure your APIs um, by using our API token authentication app for Confluence and Jira. Take control of your API. Allow users to create unique API tokens for different integrations. It's more secure than passwords and even works in single sign-on environments. No changes in your third-party applications are required. Only replace the password with a token. Okay, let's start with a little bit of background. Uh, here I'm using Port to make an API call, and it's an API call to um, a resource on our Jira server, uh, slash myself at the end, which essentially gives me a JSON object back with detailed information about the currently logged in user. So the user I'm executing um, the call with. So you see, for example, here, my display name comes back as Christian Reichert. Relatively simple call. If I look into a bit more detail about this, um, uh, in terms of um, authentication, you can actually see it's what it's called basic authentication, um, where I have to enter my username and my password. Um, and you see that in the actual get request at the bottom, um, as the authorization are basic, um, and this long string of characters. Yeah, might even look relatively secure, but hey, let's look at it in a bit more detail. If I take this blob that's behind this authorization string and run that through a resource like decode base 64, you see it's actually plain text behind that. It's my username, column, my password, and my password in clear text. So if I capture this um, string somewhere, I can reverse engineer or get easily back to my um, password just by reversing the um, uh, base64 encoding. However, let's take some examples as well um, with this as a pretext. Um, for example, if I use small custom scripts, yeah, here on the right I've got an example of a Python script. Again, I have to enter my username and password. Or if I use third-party services like Sepia, Automate.io, if Microsoft Flow, or many more of them, um, they generally ask me for the username and password um, and, and the base URL of my Jira server um, in order to access that. And they actually have to store the password in the clear text, or at least in a reversible encryption. So if you normally do store a password in a database, then you hash it a couple of times, salt it, pepper it, um, so that, um, that you don't have to um, save the original password, that you just have a um, hashed string, which is a one-way um, function, so that you can, if someone enters this password, you can apply the same logic again and you can compare the resulting hashes. But since these services actually do have to create um, this authorization header, and you've seen that authorization header actually contains your password in clear text to be transmitted to the um, Jira or Confluence server, they actually have to store it either in clear text or at least in a reversible um, encryption. And I think that is quite important um, uh, to note. So what's the problem um, with that? Well, first of all, uncontrolled API usage can leak and expose your data. So if you don't know which other services uh, people have connected to, um, to your Jira, um, you actually don't know um, where your data flows. Also, if you don't, um, if all those services can do everything with the rights and settings that that user has, um, it also means that you can actually, um, um, that, that these services can do the same thing as a user can do. Um, then the other thing is these services or the scripts the user has written, um, they need to save that password in clear text. Yeah. Um, so it's relatively easy exploitable if those services get hacked. Uh, but also, if you are in an environment where you connected your Jira or Confluence, for example, to Active Directory, then this password is used for way more than just your Jira or Confluence access. Um, so and that means that very often leads to, if that password gets lost from one of the third party services or a script that someone uh, accidentally checks into Bitbucket with the password in there, um, the damage tends to be much, much bigger than just your Jira instance, um, which would be bad enough, no question about it. Um, 
but um, people might get access to your VPN, to your file services, to email, um, which can give them a lot of, um, of platform uh, to expand their access and try to exploit even more systems. Yeah? And very often, not, or not, not seldomly, this access that you've given or the password you've, you've saved on uh, Zapier um, gets forgotten about. You don't really use it anymore, but it's still there, it's still saved there. Um, so if that's still your same password three years down the line and it gets hacked, then you might not even connecting the dots when you hear Zapier has been hacked and you might not even realize, oh, that could affect me as well. Yeah. So what, does, uh, what controls does Jira and Confluence give you out of the box here? Well, no, simple answer, it's uh, none really. So um, there's nothing to restrict basic auth on the APIs, there's nothing to limit API access or so that you can do with um, onboard stuff in Jira and Confluence. But I want to give you some solutions here as well. So what have we seen some customers doing in the past? Well, a relatively blunt tool is to restrict API usage, or it's more like forbid the use of uh, basic authentication on reverse proxies, or proxies in front of your Jira or Confluence. Yeah, so this is an example for Nginx. It just overrides the authorization header. So anything that someone sends in with an authorization header just gets replaced to nothing which essentially means basic auth won't work um, for a user. But um, that's a relatively blunt tool. It's a bit all or nothing, yeah? No one can or everyone can. I know there are some more details that you might um, tweak with on Nginx, like IP address range things. So you can be a little bit more um, advanced with Nginx, but it's by far not that you have a per user or or those kind of controls um, over this. Then another solution, which tends to be quite comprehensive, is web application firewalls. They give you a lot more control, but they also tend to be quite expensive, very hard to set up in terms of that you have to have a lot of consulting knowledge, a lot of experience operating uh, web firewalls, um, go through a big learning um, um, section with um, Jira and Confluence because there are no good defaults for those applications. So web application firewalls can be a good solution, um, but it's also a big, big overhead. The other solution is our API token authentication app that we developed. It basically brings the API token, personal access token, app specific password, so it's called many names, this kind of concept to Confluence and Jira. It's a pretty common way to solve this problem in the internet, so Lessing Cloud uses it. Bitbucket has it, Office 365, so it's a very common way. And a token usually um, is a very complex password for a specific use. So you can have multiple per user account um, dedicated to um, one function, like integrating with Zapier, like um, for this script. Um, and in our case, for example, I believe it's 39 characters, so um, quite long and quite complex. Um, also, uh, tokens generally uh, from the concept can be scoped, which means it can, it's, um, it can be limited in the way that the token can actually do. So think, for example, read-only token or things like that. So I'm just going to show you um, our app a little bit. So it's uh, relatively easy to create tokens. So I can create a new API token, um, give it a description. Um, give it a maximum lifetime that could be unlimited or that could be um, nailed down to something shorter if I only need it for a temporary case, which is very good because it means you can't really forget it. So if you give it a expiry of let's say a year, uh, you can be sure that it can't be used after a year, even if you've long forgotten about your SAPI integration, for example. So you create the token, um, you get the token context, that's the only time you actually see the token. Um, so copy it, save it in a secure place, and then you can start using it in your um, uh, third-party service. But for admins, for example, we actually have a lot more um, goodness in the app. Um, one thing is um, you can define um, permissions, for example. Um, so who can create tokens, who can create tokens on behalf of other users, and who can actually use tokens. So with that combination of defining either everyone or certain groups of people who can do these things, um, you can actually replicate a lot of different use cases. Yeah? You can create a simple one, like everyone can 
create his own tokens and use them. Uh, but you can also create a much more controlled way where you would say, well, um, actually no normal user can create his tokens. Only the, let's say, group Jira administrators can create tokens and they can also create tokens on behalf of other users. And then normal users can use these tokens um, or a combination thereof. So there's a, a variety of combinations that you can achieve um, uh, with these settings. And that's really cool because it gives you a lot of control over um, who can use tokens in the first place, who can create them, um, etc. And one of the nicest use cases I've seen was one customer really building a, a JSD integration um, to, um, for users to request tokens, then um, using our API um, to generate tokens on behalf of those users and give them the results so that they could actually use them. So they have a whole nice approval chain um, in it. So um, the next one um, that you can also do is um, if you look at some system-wide settings that you can configure, for example, you can, as an admin, restrict the maximum validity of a token. So for example, maximum would be three months or a year. Um, you can also restrict, um, in general, the um, uh, IP address range from which tokens can be used. So if you, for example, only want tokens to be available from your internal network or even a, a further nailed down um, source, you can do that as well. And another pretty cool feature is that you can completely disable the uh, basic authentication with username and password. So far, if that's not disabled, um, users can still use their username and password um, to do that. Um, but this setting allows you to completely disable um, the old way so that only authentication via token uh, tokens are allowed. Another pretty cool use case um, is that API tokens can overcome challenges in single sign-on environments. Yeah? If you have environments where users in your Jira application or Confluence don't have a local password because they've been created, for example, via our SAML plugin uh, without a password, then API token can be a great solution for them um, to actually um, use the API with scripting and third-party um, integrations in the first place. I hope you like this presentation. If you want to find out more, then um, uh, please approach me um, in our Zoom room or um, uh, get in contact via our support. Um, and we'd certainly love to explain you more about this. Thanks, guys.